All right, class. Uh, so this is chapter six of Frederick Douglass. He has just arrived in Baltimore and met his new family, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Old, and their son, uh, Thomas, that he will be taking care of. My new mistress, that would be Mrs. Old, my new mistress proved to be all she appeared when I first met her at the door, a woman of the kindest heart and finest feelings. Remember, her smiling at him was the first time Frederick Douglass has ever seen a white woman smile at him. She had never had a slave under her control previously to myself, and prior to her marriage, she had been dependent upon her own industry for a living. She was a trade. She was by trade a weaver. So weaving would be using uh, fabric and weaving it together to, to make cloth. And by constant application to her business, she had been in a good degree preserved from the blighting and dehumanizing effects of slavery. So she has always, um, she's done for herself. She's never had a slave before. She's earned her own money and made her own way in life. Um, and now this is her first time having a slave. And he says that she has been preserved from the dehumanizing effects of slavery. Well, we'll have to see what he means by that because usually we think of the dehumanizing, we think of the slaves being lowered down to the level of animals. I was utterly astonished at her goodness. I scarcely knew how to behave towards her. She was entirely unlike any other white woman I had ever seen. I could not approach her as I was accustomed to approach other white ladies. My early instruction was all out of place. The crouching servility, usually so acceptable a quality in a slave, did not answer when manifested toward her. So the way that he should normally act around a white woman, like lowering his eyes, keeping his head down, um, it's not, she's not um, open to, to being treated that way. Her favor was not gained by it. She seemed to be disturbed by it. She doesn't like him acting like he's been trained to act around his white mistresses. She did not deem it impudent or unmannerly for a slave to look her in the face. The meanest slave was put fully at ease in her presence, and none left without feeling better for having seen her. Her face was made of heavenly smiles and her voice of tranquil music. So think of that. Her face is a heavenly smile, almost angelic, and her voice is like music. And she does not, um, she's disturbed by the way Frederick Douglass wants to act, lowering his eyes, keeping his head bowed um, the way a slave would. She doesn't like that. But alas, this kind heart had but a short time to remain such. The fatal or deadly poison of irresponsible power was already held in her hands and soon commenced its infernal or evil work. That cheerful eye under the influence of slavery soon became red with rage. That voice made all of sweet accord changed to one of harsh and horrid discord. And that angelic face gave place to that of a demon. So she's going to change very rapidly. She's going to go from angel to demon, from beauty to ugliness. And why? Because she has an irresponsible power, being in charge of another human being. Very soon after I went to live with Mr. and Mrs. Old, she very kindly commenced or began to teach me the ABC. So he's learning, she's teaching him the alphabet. Remember, Slaves were purposely kept ignorant. On the plantation, no slaves were taught to read, but she decides to teach them. I had learned this. After I had learned this, she assisted me in learning to spell words of three or four letters. Just at this point of my progress, Mr. Old found out what was going on and at once forbade Mrs. Old to instruct me further, telling her, among other things, that it was unlawful as well as unsafe to teach me to read. So her husband finds out what she's doing and he puts a stop to it. He puts his foot down. Absolutely not. It's illegal and it's unwise. It's unsafe. To use his own words further, he said, if you give a slave an inch, he will take an L. An L is a longer distance. That's the same expression we use. If you give a person an inch, they take a mile. A slave should know nothing but to obey his master, to do as he is told to do. Learning would spoil the best slave in the world. Now, said he, if you teach that slave, speaking of myself, how to read, there would be no keeping him. 
it would forever unfit him to be a slave. He would at once become unmanageable and be of no value to his master. As to himself, it could do him no good, but a great deal of harm. It would make him discontented and unhappy. So don't, don't teach, he's saying, don't teach Douglas to read. You're going to ruin him and you're going to make him miserable. These words sank deep into my heart and stirred up emotions within that lay slumbering and called into existence an entirely new train of thought. It was a new and special revelation or discovery, explaining dark and mysterious things with which my youthful understanding had struggled, but not struggled in vain. I now understood what had been to me a most perplexing or confusing difficulty. To wit, the white man's power to enslave the black man. It was a grand achievement and I prized it highly. From that moment on, I understood the pathway to freedom. So he says, I understand now how the white man has so much power. He couldn't understand before. Why are, why are all the blacks enslaved and why do the whites have power? Why does this system work? And he says, I get it now because we're kept ignorant and we're not able to read. Once we learn to read, we will start to think for ourselves and we will start to realize that this system is wrong and screwed up and we will start to try and do something about it. So this was the pathway to freedom, learning to read and write. It was just what I wanted and I got it at a time when I the least expected it. While I was saddened by the thought of losing the aid of my kind mistress, I was gladdened by the invaluable instruction which by the merest accident I had gained from my master. So him hearing his master tell his wife why she shouldn't teach Douglas um, was actually the best thing that could have happened because now he knows what to him was the great secret of how slaves are kept enslaved. Though conscious of the difficulty of learning without a teacher, I set out with high hope and fixed purpose at whatever cost of trouble to learn how to read. The very decided manner with which he spoke and strove to impress his wife with the evil consequences of giving me instruction served to convince me that he was deeply sensible of the truth he was uttering. It gave me the best assurance that I might rely with the utmost confidence on the results which he said would flow from teaching me to read. What he most dreaded, I most desired. What he most loved, that I most hated. That which to him was a great evil to be carefully shunned was to me a great good to be diligently sought. And the argument which he so warmly urged against my learning to read only served to inspire me with the desire and determination to learn. In learning to read, I owe almost as much to the bitter opposition of my master as to the kindly aid of my mistress. I acknowledge the benefit of both. So starting to learn to read and the motivation to want to keep doing it was it started with the wife teaching him, but it was actually the husband being so against it that just made him that much more determined to do it. Maybe kind of like when parents tell their teenagers they shouldn't do something, but the teenager kind of just wants to do it more because mom or dad said not to do it. I had resided but a short time in Baltimore before I observed a marked difference in the treatment of slaves from that which I had witnessed in the country. A city slave is almost a free man compared to a slave on the plantation. He is much better fed and clothed and enjoys privileges altogether unknown to the slave on the plantation. There is a vestige of decency, a sense of shame that does, not, does much to curb and check those outbreaks of atrocious cruelty. So, or excuse me, atrocious cruelty, so commonly enacted upon the plantation. So city slaves are treated better. They, there's not as much of that violent, awful, atrocious whipping and beating um, that happens on the, the country plantations. He is a desperate slaveholder who will shock the humanity of his non-slaveholding neighbors with the cries of his lacerated slaves. Few are willing to incur the odium attaching to the reputation of being a cruel master. And above all things, they would not be known as not giving a slave enough to eat. So slaveholders, slave owners in the city don't want to be known as evil and cruel and, and withholding food from the slaves, which is really different from how the overseers treated the slaves on the plantation. They wanted that reputation of being bad. Every city slaveholder is anxious to have it known of him that he feeds his slaves well. And it is due to them to say that most of them do give their slaves enough to eat. There are, however, some painful exceptions to this rule. Directly opposite to us on Philpott Street lived Mr. Thomas Hamilton. 
he owned two slaves. Their names were Henrietta and Mary. Henrietta was about two years of age, Mary about 14, and of all the mangled and emaciated or starved creatures I ever looked upon, these two were the most so. And Henrietta and Mary would, would both be female slaves. His heart must be harder than stone that could look upon these and be unmoved. The head, neck, and shoulders of Mary were literally cut to pieces. I have frequently felt her head and found it nearly covered with festering or infected and oozing with pus sores caused by the lash of her cruel mistress. I do not know that her master ever whipped her, but I have been an eyewitness to the cruelty of Mrs. Hamilton. So it's not a husband here, but the wife that's doing the abusing. I used to be in Mr. Hamilton's house nearly every day. Mrs. Hamilton used to sit in a large chair in the middle of the room with a heavy cow skin always by her side and scarce an hour passed during the day but was marked by the blood of one of these slaves. The girls seldom or rarely passed her without her saying, move faster you black gift, at the same time giving them a blow with the cow skin over the head or shoulders, often drawing the blood. She would then say, take that you black gift, continuing, if you don't move faster, I'll move you. Added to the cruel lashings to which these slaves were subjected, they were kept nearly half starved. They seldom knew what it was to eat a full meal. I have seen Mary contending with the pigs for the awful thrown or awful thrown into the street. So much was Mary kicked and cut to pieces that she was often called Peck than by her name. So Mary has so little to eat that she'll fight with the pigs to, to eat the pig food, the cloth that's thrown to the pigs. So there we see the exception. In general, city slaves are treated much better, but Frederick Douglass points out that there is a, a big exception to the rule right there. So that is the end of chapter six. Um, two super important things. One is Frederick Douglass realizing the value of education, of learning to read. He says, this is my path to freedom. Second important thing is his mistress, Mrs. Old. At first, she was so kind and wonderful. She was like an angelic being to him. But very rapidly, he says she's going to descend into a hellish creature. And he says it's because of that irresponsible power. So we're going to go in later on what slavery does to the slave owner and how it can ruin them as well as the slaves themselves.